Hello and welcome to this week's episode of CritCast, where we'll be discussing episode 126 of Critical Role's Campaign 2. As usual, I'm your host, Shay, and yeah, let's just quickly jump into it. So I'm going to be trying something a little bit different. Usually I live tweet my thoughts while watching the episode and i do that on uh crit underscore cast on twitter so if you want to you know just give it a little follow maybe we can interact live while watching it um yeah that would be fun but so i'm gonna be trying to follow my live tweets and seeing if that would maybe lend some sort of order to this chaotic mess that is this podcast but before we get into that let me just do a quick summary of the episode so it starts with the mighty nine in rec centrum after seeing kima and alura in iman and getting some help and they're trying to figure out what to do next who to recruit what other allies they could possibly get and maybe what the next steps are so they also try to figure out and if you remember from the previous episode it ended with a bunch of the mighty nine having dreams so caduceus having dreams about his home and Yasha having, I can't remember Yasha's dreams, but it, was it sad? I really can't remember. Anyway, but yeah, Yasha had dreams and then Bo and Caleb also having dreams with the Nine. Which, by the way, when this episode started, I completely forgot about Bo and uh, Caleb's dreams. So when, when you know, they woke up and they were trying to figure out what was going on with the dreams, I kind of had a little bit of a moment of panic because I was like, oh no, what are the implications? Anyway... So yeah, they try to figure that out. Eventually, they land. They try to figure out if they should go to um, Caduceus's home and to see what's happening. So they send some messages to Caduceus's father to figure out if, you know, the Sav- I think it's the Savalier Woods. If that's still fine, if everything's still copacetic over there, they do find out that that's fine. You know, contrary to Caduceus's dream, so maybe there isn't much of an emergency to rush over there and try to figure out if they need to fix that that happens then the mighty nine decides that they are going to sort of recruit some of caleb's uh old friends some of caleb's old friends he only had to it was just astrid and Edwolf. <laughs> um so yeah they they've decided they are going to try to you know uh get a favor from astrid because she would be more amenable to talking to them to interacting with them than Edwolf. so they decide to meet her up at a dance hall and they um so Caleb meets with her and you know it's this it's it's such it was such a sad scene where they had this dance and while dancing she informed him of you know some updates from what's go- been going on in the empire with the Cerberus assembly with Ludinus and with the I think they're called the false trucker I think that's what they're called again my memory is bad forgive me for that um but yeah, so she has some conversations about that. She informs Caleb that the Mighty Nine were being trailed all the way to the north with Lady Vestorogna by Ludinus because and so so that she she basically lets Caleb know that essentially Ludinus is aware that Lady Vestorogna is no longer in play and a huge member of the Severus Assembly is has been missing for I don't know, I guess weeks now and so she lets them know that they were followed to um to the north to isle cross and she also she also kind of hints at caleb that now would be a good time to take out trent akathon which i have thoughts i have thoughts anyway after the meeting bo follows uh bo follows what's her face astrid she follows her down an alleyway where where Astrid just basically slumps in and curls in on herself. And I, I guess maybe she was crying. I can't remember if Bo's perception was high enough or insight check or whatever was high enough to see if she was actually crying, like what the reason for that was. But it seemed like she was sort of having a moment of conflict after the meeting. Anyway, they go back to the tavern. They have a discussion with Caleb about the implications of what uh, Astrid told them of the events that were happening and after that they get in they get a room somewhere like a dank room caleb sets up his tower and the most adorable part of this episode bo and yasha finally finally have their date and it's really adorable with ninja cats and memories and they sort of talk out their feelings and it's 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 adorable it's cute it's cheesy it's kind of slightly awkward but you know if it wasn't awkward then it wouldn't be Bo and Yasha so we have that we have some amazing character moments and and my 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 first thought 
after the episode ended was just... It's very interesting to see the juxtaposition of Caleb and Astrid's love, like old love, right? With new love that's springing forth with, you know, Bo and Yasha. And it's it's very interesting to see as 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 a sort of... Matt says at the end of the episode, a reminder of what they're fighting for, what is at stake, should they lose, should the tomb takers, you know, have their way, should the empire fall, should the dynasty fall. Anyway, yeah, so the, uh, the episode, like I said, it starts off with the, the, the nine, with Caleb and, Caleb and Bo trying to figure out what their dreams mean, and the, again, they have, they have additional eyes on them. So now Caleb and Bo have two eyes of the nine, of the nonagon on them, which I, I don't know what this means. I want to know what this means, but I don't know what this means. I guess the only thing that we know now for sure is that they don't need to read the journal more to get eyes. They just need to sleep. What are the implications for this? Does this mean they're getting to be closer to uh, Lucian? Which, something I keep forgetting is that Vesta Rugna also had the nine eyes on her. And yet Lucian was able to kill her. Now, if, if my memory serves me, he snuck into her room, I think, while she was sleeping and killed her. What are the implications for that for Bo and, and, and Caleb? Was he because we know Vesta Rogna was I mean she was powerful. She was a member of the Cerberus Assembly. Like she she had some hard hitting, you know, like she was strong. So why in my I can't really remember explicitly how uh how Lucian was able to kill her. Do, do we know apart from the fact that he snuck into her room, do we know the exact situation were we ever told? I don't think so. If if we were, just let me know in the comments, but I don't think we, we were informed. But my sort of conspiracy theory, which might be wrong, you, you guys know better than I, I, I do, so maybe you can inform me better. But my conspiracy theory is that when she, because she was asleep in her chambers, maybe that made her weaker and made her more vulnerable. And so Lucian was able to, you know, come in, which scares me for the implication for Caleb and Bo. Does that mean while they sleep? They're more susceptible to Lucian's uh, device, Lucian's, you know, will or whatever he wants to do. Or is Lucian just that powerful and that scary that even a member of the Cerberus Assembly, like, you know, it's not a big deal for him. And what are the implications? Does that even mean that, like, even if the Cerberus Assembly didn't know about Lucian, which I don't think they do, right? It's, uh, from the episode, I don't... Uh, I think it was uh, Ford that said that maybe, um, maybe Ludinus, the Cerberus Assembly, maybe they don't know about Lucian because they they could only follow them um, in Isolcross until they until they polymorphed, and the first time they polymorphed was before they met Lucian in Isolcross. So maybe, you know, all of the Cerberus Assembly knows is that Lady Vesterogna is missing. They don't know anything about you know the Tomb Takers and their plans. Where was I going with this? Oh yeah, so even if they did know, even if the Serpus Assembly didn't know about the Tomb Takers and their plans, I mean, Lucian was able to take out Vestorogna, so what could they conceivably, conceivably do to stop him? Anyway, but that's just conjecture at this point. That's not my main, uh, that's not my main focus. My main focus is just, what do the eyes mean? Oh my gosh, what do they mean? We keep going back and forth. It's important. I don't know. I'm, I don't know. My head is spinning at this point. I still think it's Lucian's way of sort of taking control over Caleb and Bo and taking control of their mind. Some said that maybe it's just his arrogance that let him read them. because it wouldn't make sense for Lucian to give them something that would give them powers, right? But some people were saying that maybe uh, it's just Lucian's arrogance and his curiosity, and that's why he gave them the journal and let them read it. Anyway, that's not the main part of this episode. That was just a little part. Generally, it was just fun to see the Mighty Nine sort of, you know, just dick around like they used to. <laughs> and I think I think <laughs> the funniest part of this episode is just this episode was the episode where everybody just wanted to slap Ford on the tit just for the heck of it. <laughs> Seriously. I think Caleb slapped him on the tit, like, how many times? 
two or three times, right? For um, Bo did it once, uh, Veth did it at the end, and then the traveler also did it because it was fun. So th- that was it. Was just fun to see them just fucking around, just chilling, you know. Just because I'm rewatching the old episodes, and so I'm seeing that sort of they had this dynamic. It was fun. It was cool. Whatever. Anyway, so let's move on to the conversation that Caleb had with uh, with Astrid while they were dancing in the dance hall. That that whole scene made me sad for Caleb. First of all, I don't trust Astrid. Straight up. I don't. She's suspicious. Very, very suspicious. She lets them know that uh, Ludinus is aware of everything that they had been doing, at least up till the point where they, you know, where Vesta Rogna hired them and took them to Isocross to the north. So Ludinus is aware of that. They are aware that Lady Vesta Rogna, she's out of play. I don't think they know if she's dead or what happened to her body, but they know that the last people to be seen with her is the Mighty Nine. Right? Astrid knows this. Ludinus knows this. So we can assume that the Cerberus Assembly knows this. And now Astrid is making Caleb aware of what the Cerberus Assembly knows. But she also intimates that now would be a good time to murder Trent Ikathon. And that was when I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down a bit. So you're telling me that the Cerberus Assembly is aware that the last people to see Lady Vestorogna is the Mighty Nine. And the Mighty Nine, they know, the Cerberus Assembly knows that the Mighty Nine is currently, I think, in Rex Centrum? Anyway, whatever, they know where they are. And you're telling me that now would be a good time to take out Trent Akathon, knowing fully well the history between Caleb and, and Trent, and knowing that they could easily tie Caleb to the murder of Trent, knowing that they could easily tie the Mighty Nine to the, to the disappearance of, of Lady Vesta Rogna, and like now is a per- why is it a perfect opportunity? Why it's it's not a perfect opportunity. It's a perfect opportunity if if yeah okay Trent dies, Lady Vesterogna dies, Ludinus is gonna probably think the Mighty Nine had something to do with it, and it's gonna make them fugitives in the Empire. So my theory, uh, my theory is that Astrid wants to get rid of Trent Ikathon, and she wants to take his place and rise to power. But she doesn't want to do the dirty work, so she's going to get Caleb to do the dirty work, which just makes her insidious as fuck. She just wants to use Caleb and the Mighty Nine, I think. I don't know. What do you guys think? Maybe maybe I'm wrong. What do you guys think? Because I, I just think she's trying to make use of the perfect opportunity because, of course, if Trent Ikathon dies, the Mighty Nine is, in, you know, is where he is. Everybody knows that they're there. Who are they going to suspect? The, the the wizard who has openly scorned him, who has openly said he doesn't like him, who also happened to be with the group that last saw Lady Vestorogna, another member of the Cerberus Assembly. Ooh, it's, it would just be perfect to pin the murder of Trent Ikathon on Caleb, and then she can just step in and take his place. And I, I do not trust her. Anyway... But Caleb also makes it clear that he doesn't trust her. And it's sort of this sad scene because they're sort of reliving their past memory and talking about how they don't trust each other while they're dancing. And I don't know, I felt like maybe this was something they used to do together and they're speaking Zemnian. And it's just, it's very sad for me to see that all the possible love interests of Caleb are just horrible, horrible people. I mean, who do we have? Who do we have? We have Essek and like Caleb straight up doesn't trust it. I mean, he likes Essek, but he doesn't trust Essek. And then we have Astrid, someone who's he, Caleb himself says she's very ambitious and he doesn't know if there would be a difference between her and Trent Ikathon if she was to take Trent Ikathon's place because Trent is everything that's wrong with the Empire. And so that's what Astrid could represent. That, so that whole scene of him just sort of I don't know. I've, it just felt like maybe Caleb just wanted a sweet moment and he's longing for like a connection, someone he can trust apart from the nine, but someone he could trust. Because I think to a certain extent, we can't say that Caleb does trust the nine, but he wants someone he can trust. And maybe he's like reliving an old memory. And it was just that scene was just so sad to see how 
much was taken from Caleb, how much his heart was broken, and how our our favorite pyromaniacal hobo wizard is just such a sad boy, and he just needs a hug. <laughs> Seriously, this episode made me extra sad for him, because you could tell that there was just this longing and this wanting a connection that he knew he couldn't have, and that was that was very sad. Anyway, so yeah, there is this moment. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Not and Caleb, maybe it's because of the new configuration of the space, but Not and Caleb have sort of been drifting apart recently. But in this episode, we had a moment where Not, and again, with, you know, Not being best friends with Jester, that's, you know, who Not, you know, has been clinging to recently. So maybe that has left Caleb a bit alone. Our, our, Our boy is really sad. Our boy is so, so sad. Anyway. So yeah, but we had a very sweet moment where Nod goes to Caleb and she's trying to tell him if, like, she asks him, I I, I don't know if she was the one who asked him or Ford was, it was Ford who asked him, do you want to kill Trent? If you had that opportunity, would you take it? And, And Caleb is like, yeah, I would take it, but that would be out of revenge. We have greater things to worry about. We have the end of the world to fucking worry about. We shouldn't worry about my petty things because maybe if we're pursuing my petty, you know, need for vengeance, then we will lose and, you know, we'll get lo- you know, get off track and all that kind of stuff. And there was this very sweet moment where, where kind of not, I can't remember the exact words, but she, her sort of stance was, fuck everything that's going on. Don't try to, you know, don't try to sort of take on everything and be essentially just be selfish. If you want to kill Trent, go ahead and do it. Do it for yourself. And she tells him about how he's holding on to the past and how he's trying to, you know, you know, deal with his past. And she says, you have to burn your past. And I was like, Oof. she she not says those words to Caleb. She says, you have to burn your past for you. For you, because they're trying to talk about um, how Astrid telling them to kill Trent, how that is very suspicious. But she's like, but not is like, if you want to do it for yourself, it's if that's how you deal with your past, you're going to have to deal with with it like that by burning your past. And it was just this heated moment where you could tell that Caleb has the weight of the world on his shoulders and he doesn't think he can be selfish. Of course, he wants Trent dead. But if they go on that journey, that could derail them from their main mission. And it sort of has this moment where he raises his voice and there's all this passion. And he's like, I care about you guys. And going after Trent would be, I think, I think, if I remember correctly, would be risking, you know, the Mighty Nine and all. It's just this heated moment where it's just like, there's just so much on Caleb's shoulders. And it feels like he's just taking on the responsibility for everything. And it was just very, 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 very sad. Anyway, that whole scene ends. They get the room. I think they do also go shopping earlier on. I forgot to mention they do go shopping earlier on, whatever. They get their room. Caleb sets up the tower. And then Bo and Yasha have their date, which is so, so sweet. Now, if you remember, um, Bo gave Caleb some did i say caleb and yasha go on their date i meant bo and yasha go on their date if that's what i anyway you get what i mean but yeah so caleb helps him set it up if you remember uh bo gave caleb a list of things to do and they have you know these beautiful um dogs and they have like ninja they have ninja dog fight and they sort of have uh i think they 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 had a moment Essentially, it was recreating their memories from how they met from the start. So they had a moment at the inn in Trustin, Trustinwald, I think, where they first met. And they reminisce about Molly, and it's very sweet, and there are flowers, and they have the tower all to themselves. While the Mighty Knight are just camping sort of outside in this dingy, dank room, just like, you know, huddling outside. And then, you know, uh, Bo and Yasha have the entire tower to themselves with Frumpkin sort of leading them on this date, sort of, you know, bringing cards and taking them to different experiences. And it's very, very sweet. It was so, oh my gosh, it was so adorable. It was so adorable. It made me almost want to cry, and then you had, um, I was a weeping mess by the end of the episode, but you had, uh, you had, you had essentially Yasha confessing her feelings to Bo and telling her that she loves her, and there was this really sweet moment where, okay, let's, let's take a moment to talk about 
Ashley's role playing because I think she is so underrated in her role playing because she tends to be shy, tends to sort of take a back seat and tends to sort of, you know, you know, just, you know, be along for the ride. And maybe because of that, people don't really pay attention to her, but she puts a lot of thought into her role playing and into her character. So something I've been noticing was that Bo and Yasha, the chemistry between them had sort of been, I don't know, somewhat lackluster with the, with the recent episodes. They, have, they had their moments. Of course, they had their moments. But it's just been maybe... And I, in my head, I was thinking, yeah, it's probably because it's the end of the world. The Mighty Nine haven't had a moment to sort of have these character, you know, deep character, profound moments. And so that's probably why. But I didn't think too much of it. I just thought, oh, you know, it's either that or maybe, you know, Ashley is a shy person. So maybe that's also why it is. But then during their date, essentially, she 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 lets Bo know that she she actually Yasha has actually been keeping her distance from Bo specifically because she knows that Lucian is scrying on them, listening in on them and all that kind of stuff. And she doesn't want and because she because of her affections towards Bo, she doesn't want Lucian to use that affection against her. Oh my gosh, how adorable is that? Because you remember, remember, right? Yasha has had her mind controlled in the past, so she has that trauma that she's dealing with. She has had, you know, a history of not having her, of people, you know, basically coming against her and using her mind against her and so she's had that history so she and she says hang on I'm gonna go through my tweets and pull out the exact quote because I remember I quoted it because of how oh my gosh it made me hang on I'm gonna find it I'm gonna find it give me a moment oh yeah so Yasha says to Bo I got a lot of people in my head and I don't want to give them you Oh my gosh. How sweet is that? How adorable is that? And it's this, this, these little subtle details of role playing that we might not even pay attention to, or we might just chalk it up to someone else. But with, with, with Yasha, with Ashley, there's a specific reason for that. And she's like, I've been keeping my distance because I don't want people to use how I feel about you against. Oh my gosh. It's just. The most adorable thing, and essentially, she lets Yash, she lets uh, Yasha lets Bo know toward the end that she fell in love with Bo when they went to see Bo's family, and she saw where Bo came from and how far she's come and how she did that by herself. And she says, "I'm so proud of you." And you can tell, especially for Bo, for someone who's always wanted that attention, who's always just wanted to prove to people that she. Because let's be honest, that's what she wanted with her family. She wanted to prove to her family that she's capable, that she's worthy. And to sort of see that with Yasha, someone who she, you know, holds in a high regard to say, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of how far you've come. I've seen that you're doing it on your own. You are amazing. And this, it was just such a beautiful moment. Such, such a beautiful moment. And it was so... It was so very sweet to see this new love between them spring up and... In the midst of everything that's going on, the end of the world, the threats to everything that was happening, it was just so very, very beautiful to see them sort of develop this thing and 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 in juxtaposition with, you know, Caleb and Astrid's dance earlier on and the old romance and the lack of trust and everything is just it's sort of let's use the the, the metaphor or whatever of of a flower and with with Caleb and Astrid, it looks like the flower is wilting, but with, with Bo and Yasha, you know, it's flowering, it's growing, it's it's blooming, it's blossoming into something beautiful. And it's just a very the juxtaposition of, you know, the past and the present and like what the past can do, how it can hold you down, or how you can let it go and let it grow and let it help you, propel you to that next level and let make you trust again and make you feel again. And just to have that and to see what was really heartbreaking about it is seeing the role that Caleb played in setting up the date between Bo and Yasha. He made the moment amazing. He made little details, you know, deviating from the norm with, you know, the tub and the water slides and the ninja fights and, you know, everything that he set up and he made it 
so beautiful with the glitter and the blue flowers and the black and just everything was perfect and you could see that they were his friends and he wanted that to happen and he wanted to give them that opportunity that opportunity that he might not have oh my god sad boy caleb how how many ways can you break our hearts how many ways and it was just so, it was just, words fail me because i feel like of everyone right maybe because caleb is one of my favorite characters right he used to be my favorite character and then you know caduceus just snuck up on me because caduceus is awesome but you know caleb used to be my favorite character so maybe because of that i think out of everyone he deserves a happy ending he has been through so much and the thing is i don't even know if he thinks he deserves a happy ending or if he thinks he can even get it but he is doing for his friends the people he's care he cares about the people he's come to trust he's making that possible for them even if the world is coming to an end they can have their moment they can have their their little you know slice of heaven in this in chaotic times and it's just especially after the dance with Astrid and you know he ended up asking for um I forgot to mention this earlier but he ended up asking Astrid to get him the same necklaces that prevents people from scrying or divination uh for everyone else for the for the mighty knight so hopefully maybe you know Ludinus or even uh Lucian can stop scrying on them all the time anyway but yeah to see the role that he played in that and to see him sort of make that happen but then just earlier on that same day, he had his heart broken again by his former love. And someone, he explicitly tells Astrid, we don't trust each other. I can never trust you. And then later he tells Jester, because Jester asks him, if Astrid asks you to do anything that is against all your will, will you? And Caleb straight up just says no. And it's just that heartbreaking moment of like, mm, his heart is broken, broken, his love is lost, but he's helped he's so sweet to, to have that happen and yeah he has trauma and it's it's just it's just so sad just so very sad at how he facilitates ev other people being happy other people having things that he can't have and that juxtaposition even if this episode seemed pretty you know laid back there wasn't much action happening the character moments were so profound and it just makes you think and it it really broke my heart for Caleb this episode. Oh, I'm happy for Bo and Yasha. Of course I'm happy for Bo and Yasha and their awkward... Can we talk about how fucking awkward... <laughs> how awkward um, Bo is. It's just fantastic. Fantastically awkward. It's amazing. But yeah, it's, it's just... My heart was just broken for Caleb just broken he gave them the perfect night that he couldn't have just the, the poetry in this episode that you know oof, amazing but yeah i think those are my main thoughts let me just quickly run through my tweets to see i said i was gonna run through my tweets and ended up not really running through them but let me see if i missed anything yeah mm -hmm. any other thoughts no i don't really have any other thoughts on the episode it was it was a great episode and I kind of fell asleep. I had to watch it twice because I fell asleep the first time because it's again, 4am watching this, it's just, you know, it's just a mess. But yeah, this episode was a lot of fun. It was a lot of the old shenanigans, a lot of the old character moments. It was very, very sad and heartbreaking and I was just crying at the end, just thinking about, you know, everything they have to everything they have to face in the future and where they're coming from and just fear i was watching um the final episode of the previous campaign and when i tell you the stress not just from like you know me watching the final episode of the first campaign but the stress of the players the stress of the dm and how the stakes were high and how everyone was like frightened and everyone was scared and how it was just anxiety it just reminded me that this campaign is coming to an end very soon I think, especially with like, you know, I feel like Lucian is going to be the final uh, showdown. But yeah, so it just makes me very, very anxious for, anxious for how this episode, this uh, campaign is going to end. Anyway, I've had a lot of fun discussing and thank you all. I, I really do have to say thank you all so, so very much for the comments that you leave. 
it's so much fun interacting with you guys. It's so much fun hearing your thoughts and then giving my thoughts as well. Uh, if you have any other thoughts in the episode, any answers, any answers to my many, many questions, just, you know, leave them down. Let's discuss. And also, also, if you want to catch my thoughts live as I, you know, am experiencing the episode, maybe we can interact while watching the episode. Uh, before I get to opening like a Discord thing, um, you can catch my thoughts on Twitter at crit underscore cast. Um, I will leave the, leave the Twitter in the description box or whatever. And also, if you can, please, 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 please subscribe so, you know, we can have more conversations. It's going to be more fun. I'm going to try to be more consistent. I'm going to be try to be, you know, less of a chaotic mess and more of a slightly ordered chaos. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you next week.